The day of the attack, June 25th, began as a typical day for the village on the banks of the Little Bighorn. Boys swam in the river or rode horses or played games. Women and old men did chores around camp. Whenever possible, people took the opportunity to cool off in the water. But late that afternoon, everything changed. A group of Cheyenne warriors who had been out hunting galloped back to the camp. A couple miles behind them, an army column was advancing toward the village. As the alarm rose up from thousands of voices and rolled like waves through the camp, the serene afternoon turned to panic. Women hurried to collect family members. Warriors raced for their horses. At that moment, their numbers were depleted. Many were out hunting. But even so, there were still hundreds in camp. They jumped on their mounts and started to organize a defense, an attack. No one was really sure what was happening. Apparently, soldiers were on the way, but because of the location of the camp in a protected loop of the river, the villagers couldn't yet see the soldiers. But then a troop of cavalry appeared on the bluffs on the other side of the river. The villagers didn't know it yet, but that was Custer and his five companies who were trying to flank the camp. And then Reno's men began to appear through the dust on the same side of the river as the village. And probably lost in the frenzy of the sudden appearance of two armies was that the army scouts had already infiltrated the edges of the village. The Crow and Arikara were stealing horses and attacking vulnerable villagers. Custer's favorite scout was a man named Bloody Knife. His mother was a Rikara and his father was Hunk Papa, like Sitting Bull. Bloody Knife grew up in a Hunk Papa village and he was tormented throughout his childhood by one of Sitting Bull's good friends, a warrior named Gaul. Eight years ago, Bloody Knife stabbed Gaul three times in an attempt to get revenge, but Gaul survived and he was in Sitting Bull's village now. When the battle began, a group of Arikara scouts snuck into the trees by the river and ambushed some women and children. Gaul's two wives and three children were killed. The conflicting reports make it impossible to know who exactly killed the women and children, but the options are few. And then Major Marcus Reno's charge was underway, and it took a long time to sort out the details of that early stage of fighting. The soldiers were still several hundred yards away, but a Lakota woman said later that if they would have charged right through the camp, they might have broken the spirit of the village. Even with Sitting Bull's visions and superior numbers, an audacious charge through the heart of the village might have been catastrophic for the Lakota. And even when Reno stopped his men and ordered them to form skirmish lines and fire from stationary positions, the situation still looked decent for the army. But that lasted about 15 minutes. When the counterattack happened, it hit the soldiers like a tsunami. From Black Barrel Media, this is Legends of the Old West. I'm your host, Chris Wimmer, and this is a six-part series about one of the defining moments of American history, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This is episode four, Custer's Last Stand. When Reno's attack began, the closest warriors rushed out to form the first line of defense. They absorbed the initial volley of gunfire from Reno's skirmish lines, the volley that gave Reno's men a little hope and confidence. The warriors had been galloping right at the soldiers, but as the bullets fell from hundreds of yards away, the warriors broke off to the west to get out of the line of fire. As the warriors regrouped, Crazy Horse learned of the attack. He was deeper in the village, and he was taking a bath when he heard the first gunshots. He calmly painted his face and meticulously prepared himself for battle, which tested the patience of other warriors. But when he was ready, he jumped on his horse and galloped through the camp. As he rode, hundreds of warriors fell in behind him, and cheers went up from the village. They shouted, Crazy horses coming! Crazy horses coming! 
As Crazy Horse and a new battalion of warriors rode toward the front line, the front line started to change. After about 15 minutes, Major Reno realized his position was untenable. Warriors were massing in front of him. More warriors were riding around his left flank. On his right flank was a line of trees right next to the Little Bighorn River. Some of his men and most of his horses were stationed in the trees. But the rest of his men were standing in skirmish lines out on an open plain. Reno told the troopers to fall back to the tree line to retrieve their horses. But it doesn't seem like it was an orderly retreat. Some of Reno's junior officers had to scream at the soldiers to keep firing as they retreated and not to turn their backs on the enemy. As the soldiers ran for the timber, the scene went full throttle. Constant gunfire went back and forth. Warriors screamed their battle cries and blew bone whistles that produced ear-splitting shrieks. One trooper remembered it simply as one long, continuous roar. That was Crazy Horse's attack. He rallied many of the warriors who had been in the first wave of defense and brought hundreds more from the village and swooped in from Reno's left. At that point, whatever plan might have been in Reno's mind, which lots of sources say was now fogged with whiskey, it was gone. At the beginning of the fight, Reno had seen Custer up on the bluffs across the river. Custer had waved his hat enthusiastically, but Reno didn't know how to interpret the gesture. Did it mean Custer was coming down to support the charge? Did it mean Custer was going to attack from a different direction, now that Reno had drawn the attention of the warriors? Or did it just mean that Custer was excited about the battle? Custer had not bothered to tell Reno the full strategy before he sent Reno toward the village. So now Reno didn't know what was going on, and Custer disappeared. Reno's companies were on their own, and now it was about survival. Most of the soldiers made it to the cottonwood trees along the river, but they were starting to take casualties. And the warriors were becoming more aggressive. They surged toward the retreating soldiers. They dove into the river and slipped into the trees where Reno's men were hiding and trying to regroup. In addition to the gunfire, hundreds or maybe thousands of arrows sliced through the trees toward the soldiers. Some troopers and scouts found defensive positions in the ditches and in the thick underbrush between the trees. Others hurried toward a small clearing where most of the horses were stationed. As the troopers recovered their horses, a volley of gunfire came from the bushes behind them, and Major Reno felt the first visceral shock of the battle. One of the shots hit Custer's favorite scout, Bloody Knife. The bullet struck him in the back of the head and showered Reno with blood and bits of bone. In response, Reno issued more conflicting orders. He had told his men to retreat to their horses so they could escape. Now he told them to dismount and return fire. And then he shouted new instructions that weren't really instructions. In essence, he told the men that if they wanted to escape, they should grab their guns, get on their horses, and follow him. Then he spurred his horse and galloped toward the river crossing, leaving his confused men to decide if it was better to dig in and fight or haul ass out of there. They did both. Many who had found good cover thought it was better to hide and wait for the battle to pass by. Those who made it to their horses followed Reno. They charged out of the timber and attempted to ride straight back the way they came. But it quickly became apparent that they'd never make it all the way back to their original river crossing. They veered to their left toward the river in a desperate attempt to find the first available place to cross. And it was during that run for the river that the serious killing happened. Soldiers died in ones and twos from arrows and bullets, and then they fell in whole groups. A unit of 20 splashed into the river together, but only five made it to the other side alive. Another 15 were killed in quick succession. A surviving soldier described the warrior army like this, a whooping, howling mass of the best horsemen, the most cruel and fiercest fighters in all our country or any other. And that was before most of the soldiers made it to the river. When they waded through the water, the fight turned to a slaughter, led by Crazy Horse. <laughs>
Warfare on the plains was brutal in a way that's hard to comprehend in modern times. As the battle followed Reno's fleeing soldiers, Sitting Bull rode up to a small group of Lakota who were clustered around a dying black man. His name was Isaiah Dorman. He was a guide and interpreter for the army, but he was married to a hunk papa woman. Years earlier, he had given Sitting Bull food when Sitting Bull was in need, and now Sitting Bull was the leader of the hunk papa. Isaiah had fought his way out of the timber, but then he had been surrounded and his horse had been killed. He was mortally wounded, and he sat on the ground near his horse. The Lakota warriors were going to finish him off, but he begged them not to. He was going to die anyway, and he didn't want to go in a horrible manner. Sitting Bull told the warriors to leave him alone, and they did. And for a moment, it looked like Isaiah's life would just slowly fade out. But then a Lakota woman rode up. Her ten-year-old brother had been killed by white soldiers, and she was seething mad. Isaiah begged her to just let him die. She asked him, if he didn't want to be killed, why did he attack her village with the men who killed her brother? Then she shot him in the head with a revolver. As she continued forward and killed two more wounded soldiers, other women mutilated Isaiah's body in ways that are too terrible to say. Far ahead of the gruesome death of Isaiah Dorman, Reno and his soldiers on horseback plunged into the Little Bighorn River. They had quickly abandoned their attempt to ride back to the original crossing where they'd split off from Custer's column. They would never make it before they were overwhelmed and annihilated. So they charged toward the first decent spot. There was at least a five foot drop from the riverbank down to the water. Men and horses thundered toward the river and dove off the short cliff. As they waded through the water, they discovered there was only a narrow V-shaped cut in the riverbank on the far side that would allow horses to climb out of the river. It was barely wide enough for one horse, so the horses were trying to scramble out of the river in a single file line. Almost instantly, the waterway was clogged with men and animals who couldn't escape. They were sitting ducks for the warriors, and the warriors went at them from all angles. Some stood on the riverbank and fired down at the soldiers. Others rode into the river and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. According to a warrior who told his story later in life, Crazy Horse was at the forefront of those warriors. He dragged soldiers from their horses and killed them in the river. And very quickly, the river became a horror show. Blood ran in the water. The bodies of men and horses littered the riverbank and floated downstream. The warriors set fire to the grass, and now smoke choked the air around the scene. But even with the carnage, soldiers managed to escape. Panicked horses trampled the riverbank on the far side and opened a wider exit spot than the original narrow V-cut. Soldiers and horses who made it to the far side faced the challenge of climbing a steep ravine to reach a bluff that overlooked the river. As they clawed their way to the top, they continued to weather volleys of gunfire, and many didn't make it. One of the first who did make it was Major Marcus Reno. When the luckiest soldiers made it to the top of the bluff, the reports say that they found Reno pacing excitedly. His mind was probably swirling with a hundred chaotic thoughts. At the moment, his three companies were spread out over more than a mile of territory. Some were still hiding in the timber, back near the place where the soldiers first engaged the warriors. Some were hiding in spots along the river and waiting for a safe chance to rejoin the command. And many more were dead on the ground in the timber and the river and everywhere in between. All told, about half of Reno's men made it to the bluff in that first attempt. The exact numbers are inconsistent from source to source, but for the sake of easy understanding, let's say Reno charged the village with roughly 150 soldiers. That's 150 soldiers versus more than a thousand warriors. By the time the surviving soldiers made it to the top of the bluff, they numbered somewhere between 60 and 80 men. All were exhausted. Most were demoralized but a few shouted words of inspiration and issued good orders. It was around four o'clock in the afternoon, and it was a little over half an hour since the fight began, 
As some soldiers collapsed on the bluff and others struggled out of the river and others were butchered by the warriors, Reno's squad on the hill felt the first ray of hope. Captain Frederick Benteen and his men appeared out of nowhere. Benteen and his men were out on a scout for about two hours while the rest of the 7th Cavalry marched toward the valley of the Little Bighorn. Custer sent Benteen into the hills to the left to see if there were any villages in that direction, but Benteen thought it was an effort to deprive him of the glory of leading a charge. As his men rode along the ridges, they saw no signs of villages, and each time they thought they might be done, a message arrived from Custer that told them to keep going. Finally, after two hours, Benteen was satisfied that he had fulfilled his orders. He led the column back to the main trail and followed in the wake of Custer's and Reno's companies. At that point, Benteen's men were at least four miles behind everyone else, and the pack train with the extra ammunition was another mile behind Benteen. As Benteen's men continued forward, they heard gunfire up ahead in the distance. A messenger rode back from the front lines with orders that Benteen should catch up as fast as he could. But the messenger said the soldiers were winning the fight. It sounded like Custer had attacked the village and had already won the battle, but nothing was further from the truth. Another mile or so up the trail, Benteen met another messenger. That one had a note from Custer that read, Benteen, come on, big village, bring pack. Benteen scrutinized the note. It seemed to say two different things at the same time. The first part told Benteen to hurry to the front lines, which made it sound like the fight was still going. If so, then the priority seemed to be to get Benteen's men into the fight as quickly as possible. But Custer also said to bring the pack animals that had the extra ammo. To do that, Benteen would have to ride a mile back to the pack train and somehow force the slow-moving mules to move faster. Benteen couldn't do both at the same time. He couldn't rush his soldiers to the front line and bring up the pack train. So he split the difference. He sent a messenger back to the pack train and told it to hurry. Then he urged his soldiers forward at a faster pace to get a better understanding of the situation. Before long, they found the spot where Custer's column split from Reno's column. Benteen didn't know which trail was which, but one went to the left and crossed the Little Bighorn. The other went to the right and led up onto the bluffs above the river. Benteen heard heavier gunfire to the right, so he led his men up the trail that Custer had used two hours earlier. As Benteen's men climbed the bluffs, they got their first look at the valley of the Little Bighorn. They were still two or three miles away from the action, but they saw smoke billowing from a spot on the river. They saw soldiers fighting hundreds of warriors in the same area. And then up above the river, some men were clustered on a hill. But from this distance, it was hard to tell if they were friend or foe. Then a crow scout arrived and pointed to the hill and said, soldiers. Benteen and his men rode toward the hill. As they approached, Reno rode out to meet them. He implored Benteen to stop and help. Reno said his command had been cut in half and they were whipped. Benteen said he had orders to advance to Custer's position. The two units should join forces and link up with Custer. But Reno insisted that they wait for the pack train. His men had used at least half their ammo during the running fight to escape the warriors. At that point, Benteen gave in. Reno was his superior officer and he was telling Benteen to stay and help. Plus, Reno's men were obviously in bad shape, and no one had any solid information about Custer. Benteen ordered his men to halt and fortify the hilltop. Two squads moved out to form skirmish lines. They needed to keep the warriors from swarming up through the ravines and overrunning the position. But as they set their lines, the situation changed. Somewhere down the valley, gunfire erupted 
the sounds of loud volleys rolled over the hills and reached the bluff that would soon be known as Reno Hill. Suddenly, hundreds of warriors below the bluff turned and sprinted from Reno's position. They galloped toward the gunfire, which was the opening salvo of the final charge of the 7th Cavalry. Custer's company separated from Reno's company somewhere around 3 p.m. on June 25, 1876. Reno's charge happened around 3.30, and by 4 p.m., Reno's survivors were scrambling up the bluff that became known as Reno Hill. At about the same time, Custer began his attack on the village. When he had separated from Reno, he led his five companies through the hills above the river until he could finally get a good look at the village. It was bigger than anyone expected, maybe two miles long. He could reasonably assume that most of the warriors had rushed off to fight Reno, which left the women and children vulnerable to capture. That strategy had won lots of battles in the past. Capture the women and children, and the fight was done. But to do that, he needed to get across the river. Custer sent Captain George Yates and two companies down the nearest ravine to find a place to cross. Yates's men rode down a ravine called Medicine Trail Cooley. Cooley is a French-Canadian word that basically just means ravine. Ideally, Yates would find a place to cross the Little Bighorn and secure it for the rest of the soldiers. Custer had sent a message to Benteen to hurry to the front line, and if Benteen got there quickly, they would all ride down the ravine and storm the village. If Benteen took too long, Custer's men would fire a volley as a signal to Yates that he should abandon his effort and ride up a different ravine to a rendezvous spot. When the column was back together, it would ride around to the far side of the village and look for a different spot to cross. As Yates's companies rode away, Custer didn't know that Reno's column of about 175 men had been totally overwhelmed by as many as a thousand warriors. He didn't know that Benteen had discovered Reno's beleaguered command on top of a hill and stopped to help. Custer didn't know it, but he and his roughly 200 soldiers were out there on their own with virtually no hope of resupply or reinforcement. And as Captain Yates reached the river and drew fire from the village, a thousand warriors left the siege of Reno Hill and galloped toward Custer's command. A group of about 50 warriors appeared on a hill north of Custer. More appeared to the south and east. And down in the village directly across the river, warriors who had returned from hunting or whatever else they were doing at the beginning of the battle rushed to the river and fired up at the soldiers. In short, warriors were closing in from three sides. Custer ordered his men to fire a volley as a signal to Yates to leave the river and move back up to the bluffs. Custer led his three companies in an arc through the hills and linked up with Yates's companies. In just that brief run down to the river, several men in Yates's companies had been killed, including Samuel Sturgis, the son of the commander of the 7th Cavalry. Now, Custer only had one choice. He had to move west and attempt a bold strike at the village to capture the women and children. But as he rode, he got a clear view of the sheer volume of people in the village. Several years ago, when he led an attack on a Cheyenne village in Kansas, he won the day by capturing a grand total of 53 non-combatants. To succeed now, he had to somehow round up thousands of people with his 200 tired soldiers. When Custer reached a hill to the west, he stopped the troop and delivered his final plan. He and his brothers Tom in Boston, his nephew Audie Reed, newspaper correspondent Mark Kellogg, and several others would join Yates's two companies. They would ride to the end of a ridge, then go down the hill, cross the river, and capture as many non-combatants as possible. Meanwhile, Captain Miles Keough would keep three companies on the ridge to protect Custer's advance. With that, Custer and about 80 men spurred their horses and raced toward the river, 
No sooner had they reached the river than they realized there was no way this plan was going to work. The brush along the river would make the crossing difficult, and warriors had already massed on the other side and were firing bullets and arrows alike. Custer turned his column and rushed back up the hill, but he didn't go all the way to Keogh's position. Custer looked through his field glasses toward Keogh's location, but all he could see was an immense cloud of dust, and there was a steady roar coming from that direction. Obviously, in just a few minutes, Custer was gone. Warriors had attacked Keogh, and there was now heavy fighting on the ridge. More urgently, Custer had to concern himself with the warriors who were crawling up through a ravine below the troops. He sent a company forward as a skirmish line. Then he moved the rest of his men up to the top of the hill. There was no cover there, and they would be easy targets for long-range rifle shots, but at least it was high ground. Whether Custer knew it yet or not, that hill would be the site of his last stand. For about a half an hour, Captain Keogh's men held their own. Warriors massed on hills all around them and rained down bullets and arrows. More warriors boiled up from the ravines. Keogh sent companies in different directions to form skirmish lines to push back the warriors. The tactic worked temporarily, and the volume of fire from the soldiers repelled groups of warriors who dared to get too close. But the number of warriors increased exponentially every minute. They crawled up through gullies and ravines. They slithered through bushes and hid behind rocks. They launched torrents of arrows that hit soldiers and horses. Troopers tried to hold the reins of their horses with one hand and fire with the other. But as the horses sustained injuries from the arrows, they bucked and jumped and tore away from the soldiers. Most of the horses that lived through the barrage galloped away from the battle. And that's when the soldiers really started to fall. The warriors cut down the soldiers in greater numbers and grew more bold in their attacks. Crazy Horse and other celebrated fighters like Crow King, Low Dog, and Lame White Man moved closer to the soldiers on foot. Crazy Horse blasted away with a Winchester rifle, and others counted coup by clubbing soldiers before they killed them it quickly turned into a rout. The survivors in the skirmish lines ran back toward Keogh's base camp. Warriors leapt on their ponies and charged the fleeing soldiers. The warriors stampeded the remaining horses. At that point, the only option for the soldiers was to sprint the length of the ridge to Custer's position. The lucky few soldiers who still had their horses galloped toward Custer's hill. The soldiers who managed to escape on foot used the last of their strength to race toward their general. Captain Keogh and his trusty horse Comanche tried to make the run, but a bullet slammed into Keogh's leg and then burrowed into Comanche. The horse had already been wounded several times and he had continued to serve, but that last injury was too much. Horse and rider collapsed to the ground and they were overrun by attacking warriors. A couple minutes later, a handful of surviving soldiers from Keogh's unit crashed into Custer's camp. That might have been Custer's lowest moment. If he'd held out hope that Benteen might ride to the rescue, or at the very least most of Keogh's men would join him on the hilltop, the arrival of a handful of exhausted, terrified troops must have been devastating. There were now about 50 men on Last Stand Hill. The soldiers quickly killed their horses and laid the bodies down as breastworks. Warriors lined the ridges and poured relentless fire down on Custer's company. Even so, the soldiers were able to keep the warriors at bay for a little while. The troopers hid behind the dead horses and made themselves tough targets for the warriors who swarmed up from the ravines. But it was only a matter of time. At some point, Custer's younger brother, Tom, was killed. Custer's other brother, Boston, and his nephew, Audie Reed, who was just 18, ran from the hilltop position and made it about 100 yards before they were both shot and killed. On top of the hill, 
there's evidence that Custer might have fought for some length of time. Most soldiers used rifles that fired copper cartridges, but Custer's Remington sporting rifle fired brass cartridges, and there were brass cartridges on the ground near his body. Toward the end, he appears to have stopped using his rifle and switched to his pistols. No one can say for sure how his two gunshot wounds happened, but at some point in that final hour of riding and fighting, he was shot in the left side of the chest, and then a bullet struck him in the left temple and killed him. Crazy Horse, Gaul, and hundreds of other Cheyenne and Lakota warriors stormed the hill and killed every soldier in the area. Some of the warriors looked for the officer they called Longhair. He was a renowned fighter, but none of the warriors on the hill at that moment had ever seen him, and none of the dead had distinctive long blonde hair. But the warriors didn't waste much time looking. It was somewhere between 5 and 6 p.m., and there was still work to be done. Custer's command had been wiped out, but there were still soldiers at the other end of the valley. The battle wasn't over. It merely shifted back to Reno Hill. Next time on Legends of the Old West, the worn out, demoralized men on Reno Hill now face a siege. They're almost completely surrounded, and there are hours left until sunset. And then, who knows what the night will bring. That's next week on Legends of the Old West. And members of our Black Barrel Plus program don't have to wait week to week. They receive the entire season to binge all at once with no commercials. Sign up now through the link in the show notes or on our website, blackbarrelmedia.com. Memberships begin at just $5 per month. Original music by Rob Valier. I'm your writer, host, and producer, Chris Wimmer. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Check out our website, blackbarrelmedia.com, for more details and join us on social media. We're at Old West Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This show is part of the Airwave Podcast Network. Please visit airwavemedia.com to check out other great podcasts like Ben Franklin's World, Once Upon a Crime, and many more. Thanks for listening.